Suddenly, a song began. A cold murmur, rising and falling. The voice seemed far away and immeasurably dreary, sometimes high in the air and thin, sometimes like a low moan from the ground. Out of the formless stream of sad but horrible sounds, strings of words would now and again shape themselves. Grim, hard, cold words, heartless and miserable. The night was railing against the morning of which it was bereaved, and the cold was cursing the warmth for which it hungered. Frodo was chilled to the marrow. After a while the song became clearer, and with dread in his heart he perceived that it had changed into an incantation. He heard behind his head a creaking and scraping sound. Raising himself on one arm, he looked and saw now in the pale light that they were in a kind of passage, which behind them turned a corner. Round the corner, a long arm was groping, walking on its fingers towards Sam, who was lying nearest, and towards the hilt of the sword that lay upon him. At first Frodo felt as if he had indeed been turned into stone by the incantation. Then a wild thought of escape came to him. He wondered if he put on the ring, whether the Barrowite would miss him, and he might find some way out. He thought of himself running free over the grass, and grieving for Merry and Sam and Pippin, but free and alive himself. Gandalf would admit that there had been nothing else he could do. But the courage that had been awakened in him was now too strong. He could not leave his friend so easily. He wavered, groping in his pocket, and then fought with himself again. And as he did so, the arm crept nearer. Suddenly, a resolve hardened in him, and he seized the short sword that lay beside him, and kneeling, he stooped low over the bodies of his companions. With what strength he had, he hewed at the crawling arm near the wrist, and the hand broke off. But at the same moment, the sword splintered up to the hilt. There was a shriek, and the light vanished. In the dark, there was a snarling noise. Frodo fell forward over Mary, and Mary's face felt cold. All at once, back into his mind from which it had disappeared with the first coming of the fog, came the memory of the house down under the hill, and of Tom singing. He remembered the rhyme that Tom had taught them. In a small, desperate voice he began. And with that name his voice seemed to grow strong. It had a full and lively sound, and the dark chamber echoed as if to a drum and trumpet. Tom Bombadil, Tom Bombadil, oh, by water, wood, and hill, by the reed and willow, by fire, sun, and moon, hearken now and hear us. Come, Tom Bombadil, for our need is near us. There was a sudden deep silence in which Frodo could hear his heart beating. After a long, slow moment, he heard plain, but far away, as if it was coming down through the ground or through thick walls, an answering voice singing, Oh, Tom Bombadil, he's a merry fellow, bright blue and jacket, and his boots are yellow. Tom has ever thought him yet, for Tom is the master. His songs are strong and strong, and his feet are faster. There was a loud rumbling sound as of stones rolling and falling, and suddenly light streamed in. Real light, the plain light of day. A low door-like opening appeared at the end of the chamber beyond Frodo's feet, and there was Tom's head, hat, feather and all, framed against the light of the sun, rising red behind him. The light fell upon the floor, and upon the faces, the three hobbits lying beside Frodo. They did not stir, but the sickly hue had left them. They looked now as if they were only very deeply asleep. Tom stooped, removed his hat, and came into the dark chambers singing, Get out, you old white, 
vanish in the sunlight, shrivel like the cold mist, like the winds go wailing, out into the barren lands far beyond the mountains. Come never here again, leave your barrow empty. Lost and forgotten be, darker than the darkness, where gates stand forever shut, till the world is mended. At these words there was a cry, and part of the inner end of the chamber fell with a crash. Then there was a long trailing shriek, fading away into an unguessable distance, and after that, silence. Come, friend Frodo, said Tom. Let us get out on clean grass. You must help me bear them. Together they carried out Mary Pippin and Sam. As Frodo left the barrow for the last time, he thought he saw a severed hand wriggling still, like a wounded spider in a heap of fallen earth. Tom went back in again, and there was a sound of much thumping and stamping. When he came out, he was bearing in his arms a great load of treasure. Things of gold, silver, copper, and bronze, many beads and chains, and jeweled ornaments. He climbed the green barrow and lay them all on top in the sunshine. There he stood, with his hat in his hand and the wind in his hair, and he looked down upon the three hobbits that had been laid on their backs upon the grass at the west side of the mound. Raising his right hand, he said in a clear and commanding voice, Wake now, my merry lads! Wake and hear me calling! Warm now be heart and limb, the cold stone is fallen. Dark door is standing wide, dead hand is broken, night under night has flown, and the gate is open. To Frodo's great joy, the hobbits stirred, stretched their arms, rubbed their eyes, and then suddenly sprang up. They looked about in amazement, first at Frodo, and then at Tom standing large as life on the barrow top above them and then at themselves in their thin white rags, crowned and belted with pale gold and jingling with trinkets. Uh, what in the name of wonder? began Merry, feeling the golden circlet that had slipped over one eye. Then he stopped, and a shadow came over his face, and he closed his eyes. Of course, I remember, he said. The men of Karn Dune came on us at night, and we were worsted. <sighs> a spear in my heart. He clutched at his breast. No, no, he said, opening his eyes. What am I saying? I've been dreaming. Where did you get to, Frodo? I thought I was lost, said Frodo. But I don't want to speak of it. Let us think of what we are to do now. Let us go on. Dressed up like this, sir, said Sam. Where are my clothes? He flung his circlet, belt, and rings on the grass and looked round helplessly as if he expected to find his cloak, jacket, and breeches and other hobbit garments lying somewhere to hand. You won't find your clothes again, said Tom, bounding down from the mound and laughing as he danced round them in the sunlight. One would have thought that nothing dangerous or dreadful had happened, and indeed the horror faded out of their hearts as they looked at him, and saw the merry glint in his eyes. What do you mean? asked Pippin, looking at him, half puzzled and half amused. Why not? But Tom shook his head, saying, You found yourselves again, out of the deep water. Clothes are but little loss if you escape from drowning. Be glad, my merry friends, and let the warm sunlight heat now heart and limb. Cast off these cold rags. Run naked on the grass while Tom goes a-hunting. He sprang away downhill, whistling and calling. Looking down after him, Frodo saw him running away southwards along the green hollow between their hill and the next, still whistling and crying. Hey now, come boy now, will the do you wonder? Up down near and far here, there he fell nurse, sharp ears, wise nose, with swish tail and bumpkin, white socks, my little lad, and old fatty lumpkin. So he sang, running fast, tossing up his hat and catching it until he was hidden by a fold of the ground. But for some time his hey now, hoy now, came floating back down the wind, which had shifted round towards the south. The air was growing very warm again. The hobbits ran about for a while on the grass as he told them. Then they lay basking in the sun with the delight of those that had been wafted suddenly from bitter winter to a friendly clime. Or of people that, after being long ill and bedridden, wake one day to find that they are unexpectedly well and the day is again full of promise. By the time that Tom returned, they were feeling strong and hungry. 
He reappeared, hat first over the brow of the hill, and behind him came in an obedient line six ponies, their own five, and one more. The last was plainly old Fatty Lumpkin. He was larger, stronger, fatter, and older than their own ponies. Mary, to whom the others belonged, had not, in fact, given them any such names, but they answered to the new names that Tom had given them for the rest of their lives. Tom called them one by one, and they climbed over the brow and stood in a line. Then Tom bowed to the hobbits. Here are your ponies now, he said. They've more sense, in some ways, than you wandering hobbits have. More sense in their noses. For they sniff danger ahead, which you walk right into. And if they run to save themselves, then they run the right way. You must forgive them all, for though their hearts are faithful, to face fear of Barrow Whites is not what they were made for. <laughs> See, here they come again, bringing all their burdens. Mary, Sam, and Pippin now clothed themselves in spare garments from their packs, and they soon felt too hot, for they were obliged to put on some of the thicker and warmer things that they had brought against the oncoming of winter. Where does that other old animal, that fatty lumpkin, come from? asked Frodo. Ah, oh, he's mine said Tom, my four-legged friend. Though I seldom ride him, and he wanders often far, free upon the hillsides. When your pony stayed with me, they got to know my lumpkin, and they smelt him in the night, and quickly ran to meet him. I thought he'd look for them, and with his words of wisdom, take all their fear away. But now, my jolly lumpkin, old Tom's going to ride. Hey, he's coming with you just to set you on the road, so he needs a pony. For you cannot easily talk to hobbits that are riding when you're on your own legs trying to trot beside them. The hobbits were delighted to hear this and thanked Tom many times. But he laughed and said that they were so good at losing themselves that he would not feel happy till he had seen them safe over the borders of his land. I've got things to do, he said. My making and my singing, my talking and my walking, and my watching of the country. Tom can't be always near to open doors and willow cracks. Tom has his house to mind, and gold berries waiting. <laughs>